Hi, I'm Amy Everling. I'm the founder and director of the Salish Sea School, and we have a mission to equip and empower student leaders in marine conservation. We are so passionate about bringing students of all ages into this conversation and equipping them with ways to get involved, pursue their interest, and really become part of the solution. We had a terrific students and a scientist lecture series lined up, and unfortunately, life had other plans. So we knew it was time to bring this lecture series online. Our first series is all about orchids. We have some amazing guests lined up. So we hope you subscribe on our YouTube channel. Follow along. Without further ado, Monica Whelan Shields. My name is Monica Whelan Shields and I'm the co-founder and director of a nonprofit organization called the Orca Behavior Institute that's based on San Juan Island, Washington. We founded in 2015 with a mission of conducting non-invasive behavioral and acoustic research on killer whales of the Salish Sea, including the fish-eating southern resident killer whales and mammal-eating bigs killer whales. We'd love to hear what led you to the special work you're now doing. I've always loved animals, and whales and dolphins in particular, but the point of no return for me and my love for killer whales was when I got to see them in the wild on a family trip to Alaska when I was 12 years old. And we came home from that trip to where I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and I wanted to know if there was anywhere closer to home that I could study and see and learn more about killer whales because I was just completely in love with them and wanted to know everything that I could about them. And that's when I learned about the southern resident killer whales that frequented the San Juan Islands. Um, I ended up as a high school student interning at the Whale Museum in Friday Harbor as both a research and education intern. Um, in college, I worked as a naturalist on a whale watch boat here out of the San Juan Islands. Um, I also was involved with uh, writing and photography. I started my blog. Um, I was involved in the local naturalist network um, and that sort of thing. And my college work was also related to Southern Resident Killer Whale acoustic communication and the different dialects that each pod uses when they communicate to each other. So I was sort of involved with uh, research through college and then when I moved to San Juan Island full time, um, I was sort of unofficially involved with the killer whales. I was still going out and seeing them a lot and sharing things on my blog, but I was really missing the research aspect of, of being involved with the whales and studying the whales. And it was uh, with a couple friends we came up with the idea of starting the Orca Behavior Institute um, because we felt like there was a, a an open niche uh, for research to be done in terms of kind of long-term behavioral research and tracking some of the changes that people who had been in the region for a long time were starting to see. So for instance, while we were working on the whale watch boats, um, you know, when I was a naturalist, we would see the southern residents almost every day during the summertime. Or out at Lime Kiln Lighthouse, you could spend a week there and see the whales on six out of seven days in the summer. And all of a sudden, things started to change. And we also noticed we weren't seeing the whales in super pods as often, where all three pods come together. We weren't seeing whales in rusting lines as often. And simultaneous to these changes with the southern residents, we were starting to see a lot more presence of the mammal eating bigs killer whales. So to sort of put some data to some of these long-term trends um, was one of the first motivations to start the Orca Behavior Institute and utilizing um, a small group of passionate citizen scientists on San Juan Island who are here all the time observing the whales anyway and start doing some formalized data collection to start putting some numbers behind some of these trends that we were seeing and get those trends published in the literature to help inform policy that might help recover southern residents. What does a normal day in the field look like for you? We opportunistically study killer whales when they're near San Juan Island, so we don't have a set schedule and we don't really have a typical day of what a research encounter might look like. But when we get a report of killer whales in the area, and there's an incredible sightings network of shore-based and boat-based uh, whale watchers that collaborate and share information. So when we hear that there's whales in the area, we try to encounter them either from shore if possible or out on either our own personal research vessel or sometimes um, on a whale watching vessel and about half to three quarters of our data collection actually occurs from the shores of San Juan Island and the other half to quarter um, occurs from boat 
and we when we're watching from shore we'll observe uh, for as long as they're within sight where we can get a reliable view of what's going on which for transient or Biggs killer whales is sometimes 15 minutes. Uh, for southern resident killer whales, sometimes it's many hours or it can even span most of a day if they're going up and down the west side of San Juan Island. Monica, what are some important items you're looking for while you're in the field? When we're in the field, the first thing we're interested in is which whales are we looking at? Of course, are they southern resident or big killer whales? And then which particular pods or matrilines or family groups are there? Both so we can look at the behavior of different groups and how they might act differently, but also because we're really interested in social behavior and which groups interact with one another. After we've determined who's there, uh, we start our behavioral data collection and we're interested in things like how spread out the whales are, uh, how fast or slow they're traveling, whether they're traveling directionally and consistently in one area or are they milling and sort of staying in the same place, and also surface behaviors like spy hops and breaches and tail slaps or porpoising when the whales are traveling really quickly and lunging out of the water or some other surface behaviors that might be indicators that they're there's um, predatory behavior going on or that they're foraging. And we collect kind of these uh, different categories of data while we're watching a particular group of whales. And then later we can go back and code these, uh, all these data that we've collected into a broad behavioral category like foraging, socializing, resting, or traveling. And that allows us over time to develop a behavioral budget to see when the whales are here, what are they spending their time doing? Is it different depending on the time of year, depending on which whales are present, or are there changes over time, for example, as food sources change? We're also interested in collecting acoustic data, so when possible, we take advantage of the hydrophone network that's already deployed and streaming online through orcasound.net. We also have our own hydrophone that we deploy in the field to try and get recordings of all the vocalizations that the whales are making in hopes of uh, learning a little bit more about what they might be talking about and how they communicate. How might a student plan to become a field biologist that studies orcas? If you're a student interested in studying killer whales, I would highly recommend that you take advantage of any volunteer opportunities that might be available to you in your area, especially in the summer. Uh, throughout the Salish Sea, there are so many great organizations involved with whales and also with salmon, salmon recovery, uh, marine life in general, and any of these kinds of experiences will give you opportunity, first of all, to see if this really is type of work that you might enjoy going into, um, but it'll also help you build connections with people who are doing the work and learn more about how to prepare yourself for going into the field. It's also really important to take a lot of science and math classes both in high school and as you go into college. Um, but really just any solid background in science, any volunteer experience you have uh, will all go a long way towards helping you pursue your goal of becoming a field biologist. What are some of the highlights of the work you've done so far? The highlights of the work that we've done so far are probably the publication of our first two peer-reviewed scientific studies that really uh, demonstrated a couple of the trends that we really set out to document when we first started the Orca Behavior Institute. Our very first paper was on the southern residents and how they are not using the Salish Sea as much as they used to in the spring months because if we're talking about recovering the southern residents, we need to focus on the areas where they actually are right now. And historically, they were in the Salish Sea for much of the year. But as they've been spending less time here in recent years, it's become really apparent that we need to sort of broaden our scope and look at where they are throughout the entire year and protect those areas. And my hope is that papers like the one we published can help support that kind of work and that kind of protection for the whales going forward. 
The second paper that we published was on the increasing presence of all the Biggs killer whales in the Salish Sea. And that's just been an amazing thing to witness um, because when I first started watching whales in these waters in the early 2000s, I was actually out here for four summers before I ever saw Biggs killer whales. Now we see Biggs killer whales about three times as often as we see the southern residents. So that's just been an amazing thing to witness and to help document and get out into the scientific literature. What is your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job, other than the obvious, which is of course being out there and seeing killer whales as often as I can, is probably being able to share our encounters and our observation and the science that we're doing and that so many other people are doing with the general public. And being able to sort of simplify down to what exactly the study looked at and what they found and share that with people so they can gain a better understanding themselves of what's going on has been really rewarding. Um, the other thing that's been really fun has been we work with a uh, student intern every year, typically working on um, a college or graduate level project. And being able to help people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity come out here and study killer whales in the Salish Sea has been so awesome. Maybe we'll be able to offer the same opportunity to some of you one day. We also need to know what is your least favorite part? One of my least favorite parts of my job, if I'm totally honest, is statistics. Um, I did not take my own advice when I was your age, and I did not take enough math classes. Um, and I really wish that I'd taken more advanced mathematics, so statistics would come a little bit easier to me now. So the data collection itself and sort of explaining the results comes really easy to me, but the analysis can be difficult, and I'm often reaching out to a lot of uh, mathematician colleagues for help in that area. Um, so that's definitely one of the more difficult parts of what I do and again I would definitely recommend you take as many math classes as possible uh, if you're interested in going into this field so that the data analysis comes a little easier to you. Tell us a cool fact about orcas. It's hard to pick just one really cool fact about orcas because there are so many intriguing things about them but one of the things that I enjoy the most about them is that there are so few hard and fast facts about them. So many of the things that we think we know, there are exceptions to the rule. For instance, among the southern residents, we say that they never change pods, or that used to be what we thought, that if you're born into J-Pod, you would stay with J-Pod for your entire life. But now that we've been studying them over the course of several decades, we actually know that pod switching does sometimes happen. Like L87 Onyx, who was born into L-Pod, then after his mother passed away, spent many years traveling with K-Pod, and most recently has been consistently traveling with J-Pod for many years. Another example is I've heard a lot of people say, well, Southern residents eat fish because they're not capable of killing marine mammals. Uh, when in fact, they do actually harass, play with, and sometimes kill harbor porpoises. And it's a very bizarre, sort of unexplained behavior because they're not consuming them, so they're not eating them, but they are attacking and sometimes killing harbor porpoise, even though it's not a part of their diet. And so it's all these sort of exceptions to the rules and exceptions to the facts that we think we know about orcas that I think are the most intriguing things about them because they are constant reminders of how little we actually know. Do you have a favorite southern resident orca? My favorite southern resident orca is J41 Eclipse and her whole family group, the match line known as the J19s. And the reason she's my favorite is because I was lucky enough to get to see her off the Lime Kiln Lighthouse on San Juan Island when she was just a couple of days old. She was the tiniest killer whale I think I have still have ever seen, having just been born. She still had fetal folds on her head from being curled up in the fetus. She was a bright pinky orange color that the babies are. Uh, for the first six months or so of their life and that encounter was just so memorable and so special that she immediately became a favorite whale of mine and I've had numerous special encounters with her over the years. Um, I, I don't kayak that often but one time I did get the opportunity to kayak with killer whales and it was J19, uh, J41 Eclipse's mom. Those two were the whales that came right around our kayaks. I remember when Eclipse was three years old, um, starting to hunt and catch fish on her own. I remember seeing her spy hop with a salmon in her mouth. 
Um, and then she became the youngest documented southern resident killer whale mother. And I happened to be on the water the first time that her first calf, her son J51 Nova, was seen. So I just had so many uh, special and memorable encounters with that little family group that they're always my favorites to see. Did you have a mentor through this process? How did they impact your life? My mentor in the world of killer whale research was the advisor of my internship at the Whale Museum, which I started in high school, and that's Rich Osborne, who was the director of the Whale Museum at the time. And he's been around studying southern resident killer whales since the very beginning um, in the mid-1970s. He was a volunteer involved with Orca Survey during their first 1976 survey, and has been involved in different capacities since then. So getting to intern with him, I got to learn so much about about the history of killer whales, about uh, research in general, and he was a great mentor to me all the way through um, my college years and the work that I did on killer whale acoustics for my undergraduate thesis. Um, I still have an important relationship with Rich and we're actually collaborating um, on some research currently to compare some of the studies that we're doing now, which are modeled off of studies that he did back in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So we're hoping to do some behavioral budget comparisons across these two time periods to sort of see what's changed in how the southern residents are using the Salish Sea habitat. So it's another example of how volunteering and interning as a young student can really be so formative in the path that you end up taking. And those relationships uh, can really help you develop your research career as you go along. What is your greatest hope or biggest goal for the future? I'm really hopeful that as more and more people start caring about the Southern residents, that we start as a society to take some of the really big actions that are needed to help them have success and recover. Back in 2015, we had an unexpected baby boom where something like 11 calves were born in a single year. And it coincided with an especially large salmon run. And what that really demonstrated to me and the reason that it gave me hope was because if these whales get enough fish, they're going to successfully reproduce and have offspring and they'll be able to recover and their population can grow. So really what we need to do is figure out how to get them enough fish. And it's a complicated issue and there are so many factors involved in salmon and salmon recovery because these whales roam so far in both Canadian and US waters. They're eating so many different salmon stocks and even different types of salmon depending on the time of year. So it's not a simple issue. But I really feel like since their endangered listing, which happened in the US back in 2005, 15 years ago now, a lot of actions have happened, but they've sort of been the smaller and easier actions in a lot of ways. For instance, we've done a lot with um, improving vessel regulations and making sure boats take precaution and stay a little bit further away from the whales and also that they slow down so the underwater noise is less for the whales. Um, We've done a lot of individual outreach to people, encouraging them not to eat the Chinook salmon runs that the uh, southern residents particularly rely on, um, not to pollute, uh, not to you know allow stormwater in Puget Sound to run off and for chemicals to get into their critical habitat. But a lot of these, while they're all important, have been pretty small scale actions. And what we really need to focus on are a couple of the really big ticket action items that will make a major difference for the whales very quickly. One of those uh, action items is the breaching of the four dams on the lower Snake River. And it's a very controversial issue that has been uh, debated for many decades in terms of what are the benefits are those dams providing us in terms of hydropower or transportation. Um, of, of products like grain up and down the Columbia and Snake Rivers, but what are the trade-offs to that? How are the salmon runs being impacted and how important are those salmon runs not only to killer whales but to many dozens of other species as well? And I'm really hoping, like I said, that now that the southern residents are in the spotlight more than ever, um, more people care about them and love them than ever, that we can really come together and start finding some solutions to these really difficult problems and find a way for salmon to recover, for killer whales to recover, and for us as humans too to be living in a healthy ecosystem here in the Salish Sea. What advice would you give your 16-year-old self? 
One thing I would have told myself is to take more notes um, about all the whale encounters I had back in that time. Um, I really wish I had more details of when and where and which whales I was seeing, even though it wasn't, uh, you know, with any scientific regularity or anything. Um, it just would have been really interesting to go back and, and relive some of those encounters knowing what I do now. Um, another piece of advice I would have given myself is to power through in college and take more math classes so that my math and statistics would be stronger today um, than they are. Um, I was also pretty shy when I was 16 um, and I wish I had been a little bit more willing to sort of introduce myself to people, um, offer my volunteer services to people, uh, because the, the networking connections that I did make as a student um, ended up being so beneficial to the path that I ended up taking and even to my current career now that um, there's so many people out there that are either looking for help or are super willing to help students or show students what they're doing and if it's difficult for you to kind of reach out and introduce yourself um, try and push yourself just a, a little bit harder and uh, you may be surprised at the opportunities that'll come to you if you're able to do that. What can students do from home to help southern resident orcas? One of the most important things that people can do from home to help the southern residents is to participate in public comment periods. And it doesn't matter how old you are, your letters and your phone calls uh, can really make a difference. We've seen time and time again how public comments can really shift the conversation. The other thing you can really do is also write to your elected officials and let them know what's important to you. And even if you're not old enough to vote yet, that doesn't mean that your voice isn't important because you're growing up in their district, you're a member of their district, and you're going to become a voter. The second thing I would say that everyone could get involved with if you live in the Salish Sea region is some of the great uh, salmon habitat restoration programs that are going on. What can you say about the amazing emergence of youth leadership as we move into the future? I'm so excited about the emerging youth leadership in the Salish Sea and how it relates to southern resident killer whales. Um, even in my generation, we grew up with some environmental education and you know we started recycling programs and learning about pollution and things like that. But I would say that the southern residents weren't nearly as well known then, even a couple decades ago, as they are now. And it's really exciting to have kids and students that have grown up with the story of the southern resident killer whales and knowing that these whales are our neighbors and live in our backyard. And I'm really excited to see how those students that have kind of grown up with this innate love for the whales that live in the Salish Sea, how you'll then transform that into action and, and help recover the southern residents going forward. So I think it's so awesome how many students are excited about the southern residents and there's so many people that want to help you get involved so you can help us in the fight for their recovery. What is the overall impact you want to have on the Salish Sea? I think there are two major impacts that I would like to have on the Salish Sea. One is to help collect some of this long-term data on the whales and how they're using the habitat and let that contribute to documenting the trends and the changes and how things shift over time so that we better understand what's going on in the Salish Sea and can help ensure that it will remain a healthy ecosystem going forward. Um, the second impact I'd like to have on the Salish Sea is more on the, the human residents of the Salish Sea, and that's to continue to find ways to share information and share the science and the data uh, so it can be more easily understood by everybody, whether you're a scientist or not. And I'm really hoping that through our social media posts, through lectures that I'm able to give, through things like this, um, interacting with students directly, that I can help more people understand what's going on with the whales, what the stories are, what the science says, and how it all comes together for how we can take action for the killer whales. Monica, thanks for sharing all of this information. Is there anything else you would like to tell us before we conclude? 
One last thing I would like to say is that if you're interested in Salish Sea and science and killer whales, that there's really a lot of ways that you can sort of sharpen your own skills and increase your own knowledge, even if you don't have the opportunity to see killer whales on a regular basis. Um, you've probably heard lots of birds singing and uh, action here in my backyard where we're filming this video. And um, I also became a really dedicated bird watcher around the same time that I became really interested in killer whales. And all those skills that helped me identify different types of birds um, have become useful in learning how to identify different individual killer whales. Um, similarly, if you have the opportunity to get out on the water and learn about boats and either boat maintenance or driving boats, those are skills that will help you as you pursue uh, marine research. Or even just keeping a field journal and making observations of things that are changing in your backyard or at your favorite beach over time. Uh, there's so many things that you can do to explore and better understand the world around you and anything that you do that helps, um, helps sharpen your observation skills um, will really benefit you as you pursue a career in science going forward. And it doesn't have to be whale specific. And in fact, a lot of internships and a lot of college programs uh, actually really prefer that students have a, a diverse array of interests and skills like that. Um, so whatever it is for you, if it's artwork, if it's uh, writing, um, like I said, bird watching or observing, observing changes in your local area, anything you can do to sort of align those observational skills with your interests and add additional skills like photography or note taking or, or things that will help you down the road um, that will really help you become a well-rounded scientist in the future. If we want to learn more, where can we connect with you? I was really looking forward to doing the students and a scientist lecture at the end of March and was disappointed that in these crazy times it was something that we had to cancel. But I'm really thankful to have the opportunity to tell you guys a little bit about what we do at the Orca Behavior Institute through this video. And I'd really like to encourage you to reach out to us either through our Facebook page, Orca Behavior Institute, or through our Instagram, at Orca Behavior. And if you ever have any questions or anything um, about killer whales or about science or about your career, going forward also feel free to reach out and I'm always happy to answer questions from students so thank you for watching this video and hopefully I'll get a chance to see you out in the field with killer whales one day soon I want to express my sincere gratitude to Monica for putting her time and energy and, and her heart into uh, the responses and, and the filming of this interview I hope that uh, when you hear the different roads mountains and valleys our guests have been on and, and really listen to their journey. It, it gives you hope that you can do anything uh, with the same grit, positive attitude, compassion, and drive to make this world a better place. If you're interested in learning more about the Salish Sea School, check us out online at thesalishseaschool.org or follow us on our YouTube channel.